Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hello, everybody. Harlan Church and anybody else tuning in. Praise the Lord. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We'll give it just a couple minutes. About a minute, actually. Let some people start tuning in, and then we'll get started in tonight's lesson. Our time in the Lord. Time with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. As you're tuning in, let's just give Him praise. Let's just come before His name. Come before His presence with joyful hearts, with, with a heart of thanksgiving, a heart of joy, and a heart of gladness for all that He has done for us, all that He is doing for us, all that He's been so faithful to bring us through. And thank God He's a covenant God, a faithful God, and He's bringing us through. Father, we thank you tonight for the Word of God that is forever settled. We thank you for every covenant promise in Christ Jesus that it is yes and amen. You've guaranteed us that. We lift up the Word of God in your presence and we say that it is our final authority of our life, it's our constitution. It's our guarantee. It's the anchor to our soul. We praise Jesus this night. Father, we worship you tonight. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you that you are high and lifted up. And we invite the presence of God to minister to us this night. We look to the name of Jesus. We look to the Holy Spirit. Now more than ever, we look to and rely on completely and cry out for the manifestations of the Spirit. We look to tonight, Lord God, the, the, the gift of the teacher, Father. We look to the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, Lord. We thank you tonight, Father, for the plan of God It'll come to pass in our lives as we press upon you to hear the word, to hear your word. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you for a grace to do church this way for this season. And Father, we're conscious of Jesus and the total substitutionary work that he did for the whole world during this week. We set our hearts on it. We're mindful of it. We're mindful of Jesus. We're mindful of Passover. We're mindful of the blood of God on the doorposts of our homes and more than that, on the doorposts of our heart. We give you the praise. We're mindful of Jesus and his suffering, but yet his finished work that has been accomplished for the entire world. And, and credited to the account of all who have called upon his name and have believed into him. We thank you, Father, for the scripture. John's gospel tells us that these things I have written unto you that you may believe on the name and that believing in the name you may have life eternal. We thank you, Father. We ask you to lead us and guide us on this journey tonight. And I pray in the name of Jesus over every person that is tuned in and that will, that will be tuning in. And in the name of Jesus, I ask for a grace to hear the word, a grace of revelation knowledge, Lord. That by your spirit, you would make it alive to them. Because it's the spirit that gives life, the flesh profits nothing Father we've gathered in your name we gather in the spirit we've gathered in the name of Jesus and you said when two or three gather together you are there 
in their midst. And we give you the praise. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you for your word. Praise him and praise him. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. We give you praise. Jesus, we give you praise. Right here, right now. We lay our burdens down We come to the Father's house And lay every burden down We thank you, Father for the joy of the Lord that is our strength. I call on joy in people's lives. The joy of God. The joy that comes from His Spirit living on the inside of them. I speak grace and peace and mercy be multiplied unto you tonight in the name of Jesus. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. We give Him praise all together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you can say just a good Hebrew word that means praise the Lord, would you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, seven cries from the cross. I'd like for you to get your Bible, if you would, and let's get into tonight's lesson all together. Get your Bible, get something to write on. Thank you, Lord. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 12, verse 27. John 12, 27, please. We got a few tuned in already tonight. Okay. Hmm? Oh, hallelujah. John 12, 27. I want you to know how much we love you, how much we miss you. Ugh. This too shall pass, but this has been so good. It's been good. It's been good for the believer. It's scattered us abroad. It's checked everybody's real prayer life. It's, 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 it's just good. You know, a wilderness time can be wonderful if you learn how to embrace it. If you learn how to embrace the wilderness, I'll remind you, it's, if you read Exodus, it's the wilderness it, it is, where, is where God revealed himself the way he did to Moses. It's in the wilderness that, that mighty, mighty miracles occurred. It's in the wilderness that quail showed up every day from heaven, from the heavens, supernatural feeding, supernatural provision. It's in the wilderness that, the, that, that, that manna showed up every day for 40 years, every day manna showed up. Supernatural provision, supernatural provision. It's in the wilderness where, where out of a rock came water that fed all the people, gave, gave them drink, and all their beasts drank from that same water too. It's in the wilderness that God revealed himself as a pillar of fire and a cloud by day, supernatural preservation, supernatural protection. It's in the wilderness. You know, the Bible says Jesus being full of the Spirit was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Wilderness, wilderness is a time that where, where, where you're, you're proving God in your own life. You're not proving yourself to God. God knows your heart, but you're proving God to yourself. You're proving God to yourself. And the Bible says he was, he was, he was, the Spirit of God came upon him. He was filled with the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. There's some things that you just don't get till you are in the wilderness and triumph in the wilderness. You know, you know sad to say, but... It's because so many times people don't really, 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 really have to trust God until they find themselves in a wilderness place. 
And then because you push into God more, more begins to be revealed. More, more, more release is given from the Spirit of God in your own life because you're pushing into it. And so it's a good time. It's a great time. It's a grand time. It's a wonderful time for the believer. If you're not a believer, I can tell you um, the payment's already been paid and you'll see that tonight. But it doesn't take but just, you know, a, a, a prick of the revelation spirit on the inside of your heart to, for, for you to know that there's a God in heaven and for you can look all around you and see the creation and something in your spirit because you are a spirit that, that it was originally birthed from God. The Bible says God is the father of every spirit and we are all spirit, soul, and live in a body. So, so you can call out on Jesus, just call on his name and you shall be saved. So tonight we're talking specifically <clears throat> Wednesday night. We looked at choosing the Passover lamb. We had just a wonderful time in the word. You can go back and watch that. I'd encourage you to believe you'd learn something, believe it'll bless you. But tonight we're looking at seven cries that Jesus personally made from the cross. Seven cries from the cross. We'll start with John 12, verse 27 to 32. John 12, 27. Jesus said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause... I came unto this hour. So heading to the cross is the entire purpose of Jesus coming to earth, was going to that cross and becoming the sin substitute to deal with sin. I'm talking about a nature there, not deeds. That's another teaching another day. But for this cause... I came to this hour. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. You know, there's a real interesting point here that isn't part of our message, but I guess I'll make, we'll just make it a part right now. It says a voice came from heaven. This was God Almighty speaking. And he said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it. It says it was the voice from heaven. This is Almighty God speaking. Next verse, the people therefore that stood by heard it and they said it thundered. Well, no, it wasn't thunder, even though many times in scripture, the voice of God is, it sounded like thunder. But my point is, the Lord spoke. They said it thundered. Others said an angel spoke. You know, right now there's so many people saying, saying so many different things. So good. And my question to you is, what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Father spoke? Are you going to believe, no, it thundered? Or are you going to believe, no, it's an angel speaking? When Paul got on that boat, he said, men and brethren, he said, I'm telling you, this is not going to be a good time to sail. It's not a good time to sail. The cap There's one voice. The captain of the ship said, no, that's a perfect time to sail. And the owner of the ship said, it's a, it'll be okay. It's a good time to sail. You got three different messages coming into your head here again. Which one are you going to believe? I'm going to tell you whatsoever he t says unto you, you do that. Whatever he says to you. Well, that, that, in, that, that right there. By default, I have to know his voice. I have to know his voice. I have to know how to press in to hear God. I have to learn how to separate my own soul from the voice of the Spirit. And so I want to encourage you, you stay with the Word and you stay with the Spirit. Yes, sir. First Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, Paul told Timothy, he said, Know this, that in the last days, perilous times... That, some translations say times that are hard to bear. Perilous times shall come, shall come. Well, what do we do? Verse 14, but you continue in the things that you have already learned, knowing whom you've learned them from and you've been assured of them. Boy, this isn't the time that you drop the things that you know to be true. You are assured in your spirit. You're persuaded of certain things. This isn't the time that you start letting those 
slip and, 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 and seeking a new word, seeking a new, so many times people hear from God, hear from God, hear from God. God brings them to a wonderful place. God is manifesting. Then a hard time comes and they start looking out outside for, for all these other voices. And what happens is then you just start, the one you will go to is the one that seems the less persecuting and it scratches your ears more. And okay, that's the word I'm going to believe. See what I'm saying? I'm going to believe that one. Why? Because I like what they said. It felt good. No, listen to me. In a time like this, I don't have a lot of input into my life. There's very few voices I will allow to input into my life when I'm, when I, when it is, is it's always vital, but when it is crucial yeah. that I know where God is speaking and, and taking me and taking the church and I don't have a lot of voices coming into my life. There's, there's not much ministry that I even listen to during this time. There's, there's one or two, but that's it. I don't, I don't need this person saying this and this person saying this, and it, it's totally contrary to each other. You see what I'm saying? I need to be hearing what you can get so many voices coming into your head that you can't really hear God. It gets confusing. Yeah. Am I making sense to anybody? So it's a time that you stay buried in the written word of God and you just keep, you, you keep your prayer life up. You spend time praying in the spirit, by the spirit, a whole lot of time just worshiping God. A whole lot of time just worshiping God. Put some prayer music on and just worship God. Put on good worship music and just worship God. Some days, you, you, you know, you, on, on a real rainy, cold day might not be the time you want slow music because it might stir sad feelings in your soul. So you put, you put on joyful, put on small imperial music or put on some of them good old, uh, you can't find them anymore, but I was raised on the imperials and raised on eight track black gospel. Huh? Put on some of that stuff. Put some good upbeat praise music on, you know, and, um, but it's a good season. This is a grand season for the, for the, for the born again, for the believer. So Jesus said, for this purpose, I came into the, to this hour, verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all humanity unto me. Okay. Now let's begin this journey in Matthew 27, please. Matthew 27, <clears throat> Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 26, 27, verse 26. Then released he Barabbas. We went over this all Wednesday night, but we're starting here tonight. Then released he Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole cohort of soldiers. This is a, this is a whole Roman cohort of soldiers for one man, Jesus, gathered around him. And that entire cohort, they stripped him and they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him. The Greek word mocked literally is that it means to play the charade. They played charades in front of him, laying hands on each other and acting like they were falling down, so to say. You know, acting like they were teaching, acting like they were casting out devils. They, they played the charades and they said unto him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took the reed and they smote him on the head. Now I want you to understand, they, the Roman soldiers plated a crown of thorns. I don't know if you've ever looked up the, the, the type of thorn that was used, but the thorns are about five inches long at least. They're more like nails. And they plated that and very carefully pieced it together. And they sat that on his head and then they took that reed that they had had him holding as a, as a scepter and they took that reed and they beat that thing down onto his head, 
driving five inch thorns all the way. I mean, they would, they would have come down into his jaws. Some of them are protruding. Some of them are protruding out of the skin. This is, this is extreme torture. Okay, stay with me here. Um, they smote him on the head. And after that, they, they, after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him. This, this Greek word robe is only used here and it's for a kingly attire. It no question came out of Herod's wardrobe they, because they brought him to, to the house, uh, his, his palace. And they went in and got one of those majestic robes, wrapped Jesus in it, plated the crown of thorns, mocked him, played the charade, spit on him and beat him, beat the crown of thorns down to his head and then took the royal robe off of him and put his own garments back on him, okay? And they led him away to crucify him. Now, I want you to turn, connect, we gotta take our time because this. You have to, I wanna lay this out in a timeline as it would have happened chronologically, okay? So go to Luke 22 and we're gonna find some more information about this where we're reading in Matthew. Luke 22, verse 63. Father, we thank you for your anointing. It's different on camera. It's a good anointing, it's just different. But we're gonna, we're, we're gonna enter into the flow. All of us together, we'll enter into the flow. Luke 22, 63 to 65. Look here. And the men that held Jesus mocked him, played the charades, and smote him. This is to beat with the fist. Roman professional soldiers beating Jesus. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face, punching him. And they asked him saying, prophesy, which one of us is hitting you? Hitting him, hitting him. Verse 65, and many other things blasphemously they spoke against him. Blasphemous things they spoke against him. Now look at verse 66. This is why we turned here. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, here's the point in reading that. As soon as it was day, they did that to him all night long. This is an all night charade, mock, shame, and beat down all night long until it was day beating that crown of thorns, beating him, smiting him, mocking him. Other gospels say they spit on him. It, it, okay. Luke 23, 33. Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, two thieves, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, I, I want you to understand something. <clears throat> Calvary, the Hebrew word for Calvary is Golgotha. That means the place of the skull. The Bible will tell you that. It's important that you understand the song says on a, on a hill far away, but it wasn't far away. It wasn't far away from where they are, but I want you to understand this. I drew a picture, but it'd be hard for you to see it. If you, you can look this up on YouTube, but anyway, the hill of the skull, where the, the town is right here, and I mean, there's, there's roads back then and roads still now. Obviously, they're, they're more uh, paved roads right now, but when they were just cobblestone at that time, uh, right off of the Via Della Rosa, which is the, the way of suffering, where he took the cross. Many, many, many people did that, but Jesus did that. Went the road of the, the, the Via Della Rosa. It's a Latin term, the way of suffering. And, and it turns this way and turns this way and leads out. And then right there, on that road right there, looks like a single lane road you're at the edge of this cliff and that cliff is not much taller than, than this church. And that's the hill of the skull right there. It's very close to where you would be standing. And when you look up, 
that the cross is right there. They did that as part of the torment and the shame. The cross is right on the, I mean, right on the edge of, of that hill. And here's that road, if I'm making sense. So you were literally suspended out there like that. And you were, you were, you were close enough to the people. That was part of the shame and the mocking. They could all stand down there and jeer at you and jeer at you and Bible words sneer at you, uh, 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 revile you, okay? It was part of the torment. It was part of the Roman torment. Crucifixion was, it was only for Roman capital punishment. They, listen, Jesus and his disciples had seen crucifixion, you know? He was here on earth approximately three and a half years um, they had seen crucifixions. When he said the Son of Man, when he told his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to the Gentiles and they will crucify him, the disciples didn't say, what do you mean crucify? They knew exactly what that was. They, they lived around this, okay? So, so Jesus, that's where he was crucified and those two thieves, but right there on the edge of, of, of that hill, it's a, it's a brutal. And they said Roman crucifixion was so brutal that the townspeople would do their best to never even have to use that word because it brought up, it would strike such terror in people what the Romans would do during crucifixion. They had a, they had a capital T cross, they had a little T cross, and they had an X cross. History tells us Peter was crucified upside down on an on a X cross because he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the same way my Lord was. We know that Jesus's was a small T. It's not smaller in size, it just has a top to it, this piece, versus a capital T. Because we know that they wrote an inscription on a, on a plaque and nailed it above his head. So, just interesting information to paint the picture. Okay? Verse 34. Here's our, here's, here's our I want you to see this. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's the first cry he made on the cross in a timeline order of the seven. The first thing that he cried out was, Father, forgive them. Here's Jesus being that, that intercessor same way Moses interceded for people and many others, inter every, every prophet coming up through the minor prophets, major prophets were in interceding for the nation of Israel. Here's Jesus interceding for the entire world. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Man, you know, had he not prayed that, you wonder if we would have all been doomed if the great intercessor hadn't released those words, Father, forgive them. And, he, and he, he, he said this from the cross. And I want you to get a picture here of, of his condition while he's saying, forgive them. Hold your place there. And let's turn to Psalm 22, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 22, verse 7 and 8, please. Psalm 22, verse 7 and 8. This is, this is a prophetic psalm through David long, long, long time before Jesus was birthed into the earth. Verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying he trusted in God that God would deliver him. Well, let him deliver him now seeing he delights in him. There's the mocking. Look at verse 12 to 18. Je this is Jesus speaking prophetically. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls have beset me round about me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. This is from the scourging. This is from the beating. This is from all that he's already been through. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. Much of that is from the scourging. A lot of that is equally from the crucifixion and the way they would crucify. The way they would stretch your arms. Oh, Mike. Hang on, hang on just a second. 
the way they would crucify and stretch your arms out is, I mean, beyond your, your reach. And they would, it would, it would pull them out of joint. And you had, they would put your feet sometimes like this and put a nail through both, or they would overlap your foot and put a nail through the top, through the bottom into the wood. But you had a, you had a, a wood, a, a perch that you could, you could push up on. Most people died of suffocation. I don't have time to really get into heavy detail with that. But that's why later they would come by and they would break the legs because the law had said you can't leave them on that cross all night long to let them die. It was a slow death. Uh, so the, anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but they came by and broke the legs of the first thief, broke the leg. That way he, they can't push up and get a breath of air and come back down. But when they came to Jesus, he had already dismissed his spirit and not a bone of him was broken because it would be prophesied that it wouldn't. So that fulfilled prophecy and he's the faultless and spotless lamb. He can have no, no fault, no blemish, no broken bones, if you will. Yes. Now, so he says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. You can study these things and, and, and look at what the body is going through and what any human body would go through under what he has been through. His organs, his heart, um, he's literally in convulsions. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. I mean, he's, he's, extru he's, he's beyond dehydration, okay? And you have brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They look up and they stare at me. He's, it's, it's, he's partially nude for shame. They would strip you down basically to just your underwear and hang, suspend you out there after he had already been through what he did. Now, just stay with this. So, and, and yet in the midst of that, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And, and the, the gurgling that would have been in his words from, the, from what's going on in his body. Look at Isaiah uh, chapter 50, verse 7. Isaiah 50, verse 5 through 7, please. Are you following me at all tonight? 50 verse 5. The Lord God has opened my ear. This is Jesus speaking prophetically way before the cross. And I was, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. Neither did I turn away. Woo. There's the whole garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any other way this can be done, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Brother, that's loving God with all your heart. Matthew 26, that, that in the garden, that, that's a picture of loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all, of the, all the strength you can muster by faith. So he says, I was not rebellious. I didn't turn away. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pulled out my beard. They pulled his beard out. That was partly for pain, partly for shame. A Jewish man and his beard was very, very, it was an important thing. I did not hide my face from shame or spitting. I didn't hide my face. He trusted God. He trusted God. For the Lord God will help me. Mm. Therefore, I will not be confounded. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Listen to that. Even in the midst of all the shame, the natural shame, listen, he knows I'm not going to be left like this. I believe God. God said he won't leave my soul in hell, and he won't allow me to experience corruption. Jesus knows this, but my, 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 the faith act that he went through. Now, look at 52, 14. We're, we're, we're looking at the condition of him on the cross. Isaiah 52, 14. 
as many as were astonished at you, astonished, his, his visage, his, 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 his bodily form was so marred more than any human and his appearance did not look human and did not look like a son of man. He did not look human because of the beating, because mainly of becoming the curse of God. Everything that was involved in the curse coming to full manifestation in his spirit, soul, and body. Come on, y'all. Now, back to Luke 23, 33, please. Luke 23, 33. Luke 23, 33. So seven cries in verse 34, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want you to notice verse 34, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. So the covetous are playing games and gambling right there around the cross on top of right there at the edge of the hill. The covetous are playing games and they're gambling for his garments. That was a fulfilling of prophecy because Psalm 22 tells us that they would do that. Okay. Verse 35. And the people stood beholding. The people, the common people were absolutely astonished and in awe just beholding this. And his, Jesus' mother is here. And Jesus' aunt, Mary's sister, and, and several other uh, of the disciples and several other women that supported his ministry okay the rulers are deriding him the re so the religious rulers are mocking him and reviling at him and jeering at him saying he saved others let him save himself if he's the anointed one the chosen one of God verse 36 the soldiers mocked him and came up to him offering, offering him vinegar and saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was written over him in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, all three languages. And it said, this is the king of the Jews. Now, verse 39, and one of the thieves which was hung with, by him said, if you be Christ, save yourself. And save us. But the other thief on the other side of Jesus rebuked him and said, Do you not fear God? Now remember how this must have sounded. They, they're crucified saying this. Seeing that you are in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We're thieves. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all that thief said. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that wonderful, y'all? Isn't that wonderful? Today, there's the number two cry on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. Hmm. You know, there's a good teaching in that because one of the thieves was saved, the other one wasn't. So we have two sides of this. We know there's hope for all and anybody can be saved, but everybody is not automatically saved because we know one thief died in his sins. One thief was saved, the other one wasn't. So there's hope for all and Jesus has paid the price for all, but it's not automatic. One thief is saved, the other one died in his sins. Okay, you following me? You getting anything yet? Number three cry. I want you to look here with me in John 19. John 19, 26, please. John 19, 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother from the cross, he saw his mother. He looked for her. And he saw the disciple, that would be John, 
standing with her whom he loved he said unto his mama his own mother from the cross with a gurgling voice and his heart poured out like water his bones are out of joint he does not look human at this point Everyone is astonished at his countenance and his visage, the whole total form of his body. And he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. And what he's saying there, he's not saying, look at me. He's saying he's giving her to John. He's commending the care of his mother into the hands of that disciple whom he trusted with his own mother. From the cross, he looked at her and he said, woman, behold your son. He commended her. He, he gave the responsibility of his mom. He's giving, putting that in John's hands, okay? Verse 27, then he said to the disciple, to John, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple, John, took her into his own home. He cared for Mary the rest of the rest of her life. Man, isn't that wonderful? So that's the number three uh, cry that he made from the cross. Woman, behold your son and behold your mother to the disciple. Now, we're building to this. I want you to see something. Number four, let's go to in timeline order. Let's go to Matthew 27, please. Verse 46 and 47. Matthew 27, 46 and 47. And about the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice and he said in Aramaic, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, you have forsaken me. He cried that from the cross. That's the number four cry he made from the cross. Why has he said that? 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. We could quote this, but that's not important. I want you to see it with your eyes. Some may have never heard this. And, it, and it's good for all of us to hear this over and over and over and over and over again. Verse 21, for he has made him, God has made Jesus to be sin. That's a nature term. That's a noun, not a verb. He made him to be sin itself for us who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin nature that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The moment that God made him, caused him to become sin nature was right there. Oh, he cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, you have left me. You've forsaken me. That moment, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God. Okay, now watch this. Galatians 3.13, just a few pages to the right, says this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse. Made a curse. All this written on this cross. Made a curse for us. For us. Say for me. He was made a curse for the whole world. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. My goodness. He became the curse for me. He became the curse. He took, he, 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 he absorbed the very fullness of full strength of the curse of sin. Curse of the, the curse of sin and death. He absorbed it. He became it. Now, Number five, John nineteen twenty eight. John nineteen twenty eight, please. John nineteen twenty eight. 
This we're going in a timeline order. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. Ooh, man. That had to have done something to his inner person. Knowing that you've run the race, you've finished the course, and that it's over. And you didn't turn your back away. You didn't draw back out of the will of God. You didn't draw back out of the plan of God. I'm saying you, but I'm talking about him. Knowing in yourself that you've followed God. you set your face like flint. You kept it set like flint. You trusted God with your life. Ooh, trusted God to defend you. You trusted God to uphold you. Even though you're surrounded with mocking. You've been going through this all night. Last night it would have been. You've been mocked at 3 p.m. He's, he's at the end of this thing. And they're, the, the religious rulers are jeering at you. They're throwing things at you. They're spitting on you. The Roman soldiers are offering you drink. They're offering you a painkiller intoxicant. Um, it's vinegar and gall mixed. And we'll find out that Jesus did not take that. He, he, didn't, he didn't receive the painkiller. He received some water that was dipped in a hyssop and put on a sponge. And they just, like in a hospital, you get that little sponge that's moist and it just keeps your lip moist. That's what they did. They dipped a hyssop on a sponge and, and they put it to his mouth. But he did not receive the painkiller, the, the drug, the, the, the intoxicant. Um, but to know here, Jesus, look at this. Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. So that, think about this. So that the scripture might be fulfilled. So he's still conscious of fulfilling scripture. So that the scripture could be fulfilled, he said from the cross, I thirst. What that must have sounded like. Okay. And this is literally because he is, he's at the last moments of dying. I want you to look at this with me. Psalm 69, 21. Hold your place there. Psalm 69, 21. Psalm 69, 21. Speaking prophetically through David, long time before this moment in John. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Mm, prophetically. Okay? Look at back here in John 19, but look at verse 24. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend his garments, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, every prophecy about him, from they gave him gall and to drink, they offered it to him. He knows that's been accomplished now. They said, let, when he was on that cross and heard them say, no, don't rend it. Let's cast lots for it. In his inside, he knew another prophecy fulfilled. And so at this moment, Jesus knowing that all things, all things, everything pointing to the suffering Savior, the suffering side of our Savior, all things were now accomplished. Are you following me? Look at this. Verse 29. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. Now watch this because he knows all things. Everything, every type and shadow pointing to the suffering side of the Savior. Not the conquering side. We'll get into that more Sunday. But everything pointing to the suffering Savior, the suffering side of our, of our Savior, all things were now fulfilled. Right here, there will, at, at this point, there is no longer 
a need for a lamb, a goat, a turtle dove, a pigeon, a grain offering, a peace offering, come on, a scapegoat, a sin offering, a trespass offering, come on. He is the offering. He's all of the offering. And Hebrews tell us it's a one time for eternity offering. And now that that sin offering, Jesus has been offered, there is no offering that you could give God that will suffice. Jesus is it. When you sin, listen, I spent years just, just you know, cutting myself off. I think, no, I, I, won't, I won't do that today because I don't deserve it. Well, the fact is I never deserved it. I was just too ignorant to know that. But what I'm saying is I was trying to somehow pay for my sin. Somehow I, I, I've got to pay for my sin. I've got to, I don't deserve it. I, I got to pay for my sin. There is no longer any offering for sin because Jesus is it. At that moment, listen, at this moment, there's no longer a need for that. Now here we're going to step into the best part of this whole message, but we had to get through all of those to get to this. Watch this. Knowing that everything's accomplished now. Verse 30. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He dismissed his spirit and the Greek words allude to it's an act of the will he dismissed his spirit after he cried out it is finished he said that and he released his spirit are you with me now I want you to see this and this is where we're it's going to take us into this um, go to Luke 23 46 one more time we'll pick that setting up here because I want you to see this. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, and this is, that was the sixth cry. This is the seventh cry. It is finished was number six. And in the timeline order, here's the seventh and final cry. After he said, it is finished. This would have been said also then he's going to release his spirit right here. Verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And having said that, he yielded up his spirit. And the centurion, the centurion is the one over all the soldiers that have been involved in this act. When he saw what was done and he heard Jesus say that, he glorified God saying this. Now think about that. He's fixing to give God glory. He glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Looking up at Jesus, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, I want you to see this. Jesus said in John 10:18. No man takes my life. I lay it down of my own free will. I've been given authority to lay it down and I've been given authority to take it back up. He yielded up his spirit. He dis it means to dismiss. He dismissed himself. Are you following me, anybody? He dismissed himself. He dismissed himself. Okay. Now, I want you to go. We'll begin to wrap this up I want you to see this this is this is the paramount of this I want us to go to Leviticus 21 10 Leviticus 21 10 <clears throat> have you gotten anything tonight out of this anybody we looked at seven cries Jesus made from the cross saw that it's all prophetic. Jesus knew that everything pointing to that had been accomplished. Now, this is our highlight. This is just so wonderful. Leviticus 21.10. This is the law given 
It says, and he that is the high priest among the brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil is poured, and the one that is consecrated to put on the holy garments, the priest garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his garments. Remember that. The law said, whoever is high priest, shall not render, shall not rend his garments. The law, Jewish law said that. Whoever is high priest among the priesthood shall not rend his garments. Matthew 26, 65. Matthew 26, 65. Now this is before the cross when they're still ridiculing him and, and before the Sanhedrin, all that trying him illegally and trying him illegally and trying him illegally. Watch this. Start with 64. Jesus said unto them, you have said, they asked him, are you the son of God? Jesus said, you have said, nevertheless, I say to you, Jesus tells them this, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his garments. Hello. Illegal. Watch this. Then the high priest, when Jesus said that, the high priest, they, they rending the garment, you would grab, the, the, the high priest had a high collar that came up. They would grab that and they would rend it open and they would rip it, listen, listen, from top to bottom. Boy, if you know something about the Bible, that ought to just stick big time out to you. They would grab it. And they, and they would rend it. They would rip that, that high priest garment from the collar down, top to bottom. Yes. Now watch this. Yes. So at that moment, legally, he is no longer qualified to officiate the Passover. Right. This is Passover week that they were in. Yes. He is no longer qualified to officiate the Passover because he has rended his garments. Okay. And little does he know the Passover lamb of God is the one that's standing right in front of him. Now, but you shall, the high priest shall not rend his garments and the high priest rent his garments. Now, we've said all that to get here. Matthew 27, 50, please. Right, here we go. G verse 50, Jesus, now we're back on the cross. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, dismissed his spirit and behold the veil in the temple that's what separated huh, the presence of God which behind the veil was called the holiest of all or the holy of holies or it was called the most holy in there was just the ark of the covenant with the lid called the mercy seat and the two cherub angels on top of it and that's where on one time a year only the high priest would go beyond the veil putting blood on the mercy seat his the bottom of the high priest garment had a bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell po all the way around that thing you could hear them when they would walk through the town you would hear those bells and everybody knew Ooh, the high priest is here Ooh. He went on the day of atonement, he went in with a long rope tied around his leg in case he died in the presence of God for not having done what God told him to do and not going through all the ceremonial things, jot and tittle, tit for tat, like the law had told him to. Okay? They could drag him out because you don't go in there and get him or you die too. Okay? They would drag him out by that rope, that thus the purpose of the rope. But I want you to see this. The veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Do you know what the Hebrew people call the veil in the temple? They call it the hem of God's garment. The priest shall not rend his garments. And that high priest 
rent his garment. And listen, when Jesus cried out with a loud voice and dismissed his spirit, knowing all things were now fulfilled, God rent his own garment, saying, this is the end of the priesthood as you've always known it. There's no more goats, no more lambs, no more turtle dove, no more. One, one time a year, people can come in and fellowship with me, one man only. Now the whole world can come in through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Huh? It, God rent his own garment. The hem of God's garment. God rent his own garment. Hallelujah. And I'm here to tell me, you, and the whole world, ain't no man going to put God back in a box. (laughs) Hallelujah. That's why more than anything, we just want the flow of the Spirit. When we do come together, the next time we do come together, all we're after is flow. I don't care what we have written up on here. I care less about that. We want flow. That's all we want is flow. Everybody say flow. That's all we want is flow. We want flow when we come together. We want flow in our worship. We want flow when we're doing it this way. That's all we're after is the flow of the Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. The Spirit is what gives life. you got to have the Spirit and the Word working together. Hallelujah. God rent His own garment. Now, look at Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. And here's the result of that rending of that veil. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. Not by anything you do, not by anything you've done, do, or could do. But by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you can have real pure boldness to go into the presence of God. They knew what he was talking about. Listen, I've never been to the earthly holy of holies. I've never visited that tabernacle. I've never gone into even a a mock one. I'd love to go to one. But they knew what he meant when he said the holiest of holies. They knew, they, they, they had been among this. They had practiced. They had lived the life of, of doing Passover this way. They had lived the life of on the Day of Atonement bringing, that, bringing a, a goat and going, taking the blood into the, to the priest and then waiting on the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies and him come out and you're covered, atoned for for a year. So they knew what he meant when he said, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus. Well... The holiest of holies is simply the presence of God. We can come to the holiest of holies. We can live in his presence. More than that, because of Jesus, because of what he did, because of the veil rent, because of the resurrection, not only can we come into him, he came into us. You've been filled with his spirit. Know ye not, you are the temple of the living God. You know that, that after at, at Acts chapter 2, Really, the, the, really the birthing of the church happened when, and he, and when Jesus appeared to the, there was more, a whole lot more than 12. You have to do the math and, and, and study it, but there's, there's, there's a, a, a good sized group hiding because of fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus walked in and it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit after his resurrection. At that moment, they were born anew, new creations, born again. Then he tells them, now go to Jerusalem and wait for the, the, the Spirit, the promise of the Father, which the promise is always the Spirit. And he said, and you'll be endued with power from on high and you shall be, my, you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh... This is that spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. At that point, there is no longer a need, listen, for the temple. Huh? As they had always known it. Because your body is the temple. There's no need for lambs and goat sacrifices. He's the lamb. 
There's no need for any more high priests as they continue to do throughout the book of Acts. Because Jesus is our the great final only high priest there is. I don't care what a man calls himself, he ain't a high priest. There's one high priest. There is one high priest after the resurrection, there is one high priest and it is Jesus Christ after the order of Melchizedek. He's the high priest. And Revelations 1, 5, and 6 says, we all the believers have been washed in the blood of Jesus and he has made all of us priests and kings. But we're not high priests. We are priests. You had one high priest and you had many priests. We are the many priests serving the great high priest, Jesus. We are Lord's He's the Lord. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. And He has made us kings and priests. But He is the only high priest. And so, thank God for that. So, so we can come boldly because of the blood of Jesus. We can enter into the presence of God with no sense of inferiority. Are you with me, somebody? Huh? Isn't that wonderful? By a new and living, living, the Greek word living, you need to read it, life-giving. By a new and life-giving way, which he, Jesus, has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his body. His body. His body was what that, that veil was. And because his body was rent, that veil was rent. The hem of God's garment, <laughs> rent letting the presence of God out to be poured out on all flesh and letting us come symbolically into that holiest of holies, which is both we can come into his presence without, without the, the, the sense of inferiority. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I want to end um, with this scripture. This is so powerful. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. Revelations 3, verse 20. This is Jesus speaking and he says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, huh, any man, any man, if any man, that's, that's human, not just gender. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. <laughs> How beautiful is that? Didn't put a bunch of stipulations, regulations, religious man-made additions to it. He just said, if anybody hears my voice, in here, you hear his voice. You... And if you will open the door, Jesus says, I will come in to him. He don't care about your background. He don't care what kind of sin you are involved in at the present. If you hear his voice, yeah. huh? and you open the door, I will come in to him. Now look at this. This is huge. This is covenant talk. And I will sup. I will, I will share a meal with him. He's simply saying, I will enter into covenant with him. Yes. I will enter into covenant with him. If any man hears my voice and he opens the door, I, Jesus, I will, I will come in. And we'll enter into covenant together. Boy. Come on. Would you enter into covenant with him right now? Whether you have a hundred times or not. And maybe you've never invited Jesus and invited him into your heart. I'm going to tell you what. There's not a finer and a better hour than to do it right now. You need him now more than you've ever needed him. I need thee every hour, oh precious Lord. I would ask every person watching to say out loud, I forget about where you are, forget about who's around you. That's not going to make a hill, of, a hill of bean difference in the end. I would ask you to say this right now. In the name of Jesus, I call on his name. I ask you to release me from all sin. 
I receive my salvation. I call on the name of Jesus. I receive my salvation. I hear you speaking to me. I open the door. And I thank you for coming in and entering into covenant with me. I receive Jesus, the covenant sacrifice. He bled for me. He died for me. And he was raised for me to prove that I was justified. God is my justification. Jesus is my righteousness. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Hallelujah. Glory to God, somebody. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, we praise you this night. For you are good and your mercy endures forever. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. The blood of God struck and applied to the doorposts of our heart. On our tongue, Lord God, we speak the blood. Father, I thank you tonight that that blood, wherever it is applied by faith, the destroyer cannot come in in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we receive healing that belongs to us because of that blood that is speaking great and mighty redemptive things. We claim the finished work of Jesus Christ right now. I declare in the name of Jesus and I would ask you to agree that by his stripes you are healed. You and yours. And I want to step out in faith here. I declare that, listen to me, if you are a person under authority, then you have the right to exercise authority. And that Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, listen, my servant, people under my authority, my oversight are sick. And I declare to you watching in the name of Jesus that those under your care are healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare they are healed. And Father, I ask tonight that the, that the, that the power of God, the presence of God, the angels of God, I would ask that they go through your place of service and touch everybody under your oversight, everybody under your overseeing, <coughs> that the that the that the angel of God, the the, the angel of God, the, the presence of deity itself would make its pass through your place of oversight. And I declare on my behalf that everybody under my oversight and Jody's oversight is healed in the name of Jesus. That the angel of God, the presence of deity itself would make a pass through your home, a pass through your vehicle, a pass through your job. I declare in the name of Jesus that you are healed based on his finished work in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah bold and unashamed of this thing. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. We declare in the name of Jesus that they are reconciled. Listen to me. Well, they're not born again. Hey, I want to encourage you with this. There was 276 passengers on that boat in, in, in Acts chapter 27. Paul said, if you stay with me, you'll be saved from the storm. Huh? Him, him. We know Luke was with him because Luke's writing and Luke said all hope was taken from us. Us. He's with him. So outside of them too, there's a Roman centurion, Julius. There's a few other Roman guards and the rest of them are prisoners. Huh? And, and, and a lot of them are just using the boat to get from point A to point B. They're part of the cruise, if you will. But Paul said, when they started to jump ship, when the storm got so bad and they started to get them, them, them rescue boats, Paul hollered out, if you do that, you'll perish. In other words, this, there's no plan B. I want to tell you this, there's no other plan for redemption. There's no other name that you can be saved by. There's no other doorway that you can get to God. There's no other name given among men, given to men that you can get saved by. There's no other name. Yeah. Jesus, and I'm not talking about just a string of letters, J-E-S-U-S. I'm talking about God has given him the name that at the name 
how every knee should bow and tongue confess. Listen, there's no other plan B. And I want to encourage you. I, can, I believe based on God's word, I can say this. Even if they're not saved, if they're under your authority and you are saved and you're born again, there's a long season a person can just ride with you. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Lot was okay because he was with Abraham. Huh? Jesus said in John 17, he said, Father, he said, you gave these men to me and I have, I have, I have, I have kept them in your name. I declare in the name of Jesus right now in this season, <laughs> if they'll just ride with you and stay close to you, you're the one bringing the redeeming power into that place. Wherever your place is of authority, you bring in the redemption of God in there. You talk that redemptive work. You talk the plan of God. Hallelujah. You take authority over that place. Maybe you have. I'm, I'm not pinning this at anybody. I'm just flowing with the hope, my spirit. You, you release it. You talk the redeeming power of God. You rebuke that thing over, yes. over your place of authority. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. We have to do that. I do that every day for Heartland Church. Well, why for Heartland? Because I have authority here. <laughs> I mean, you have to be real smart to understand that. I have a, you can exercise authority where you have authority. Yes. But Paul told them men, he said, you stay with me and you'll be okay. He yeah. said, for I believe God that it shall be even as he told me. Yes. Well, I believe God it will be for the believer the, what God has said it'll be for the believer, especially for the believers that'll believe what God said about the believer. Yes. Yes. It's a finished work. Amen. This too shall pass and we shall get to the other side. Man, when they got to the other side, floated on pieces of the boat some of them swam, some of them floated on broken pieces of the ship. Hey, however, whatever it takes and however you get to the other side, just keep, keep kicking, keep kicking. Hold to the board and kick. <laughs> keep your mouth going on redemption. Hold to the piece of the plank of the, the boat and keep kicking. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it says when they got there, they did a head count and there was 276 souls. Not one perished. Just like Paul said it would happen. Right. Well, I declare in the name of Jesus that this too shall pass. And however it looks when we get to the other side, I don't know that it will ever, ever, ever be again exactly like what we've called normal. But it will be good yeah. and God will be God when we get on the other side. He'll be, he's God on the platform. He's God back at the door. He's a God in the amen corner and he's God all over this floor. He'll be God when we get to the other side. He's God in the boat. He's God when we get there. He's yeah. the God getting us there. Hallelujah. Yes. I believe for no question that we will be stronger when we get there because yes. you pushing into God. You yes. know, people pushing into God. Oh, man. The way they're pressing into Him. We Hallelujah. We won't lose a one. Hallelujah. I hope you've gotten some encouragement tonight, some joy, some hope, yes. some peace. I pray some revelation knowledge. I hope you've learned something maybe that you've never seen before. That's always fun. So in the name of Jesus, we'll gather again like this Sunday morning is Resurrection Sunday. I want to encourage you in this. Don't get down in the dumps because we can't gather on our first Easter Sunday. You know, getting down in the dumps doesn't change anything except your day. Just robs your joy. That's not going to make the thing change. I want to remind you of this. Resurrection lives on the inside of you. Yes. I'm going to get up Sunday morning and I'm going to dress nice. I'm going to put on something pretty. I'm not saying I'll look pretty. I'm, I'm not saying I'm pretty, but I'm going to put on something that I think looks pretty. You're pretty. Yeah, I'm going to dress nice. I'm going to honor God. <clears throat> it's going to be good. Amen. I'm going to honor God. Amen. And we're going to gather. And it's going to be a phenomenal day Sunday. Resurrection Day. This has been good. I've enjoyed it. We've gone through the cross. We've gone through picking out the Passover lamb, how they chose it. Now we've honored the cross during this few days. Sunday, we'll flow with the Holy Spirit. We'll intend on talking about, I don't know if we're going to talk about the resurrection as much as we're, or maybe we might talk about what that benefited us. Oh, we might talk about 
the promise that was given to us because of the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit-filled life. Who knows? But it will be, it will have resurrection anointing on it. Absolutely. Huh? And that resurrection lives on the inside of you right yeah. now. If you find yourself in a wilderness time, embrace it. Embrace it. Yeah. Embrace it. Keep, 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 stay with the Word of God. Stay with the plan of God. Stay, keep a, just keep a mindful, stay in tune with your own spirit. Hallelujah. In all things, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Stay before the Lord. Even while you're doing what you have to do, stay sensitive in your inner man. I'm telling you, he said he'd lead you, said he'd guide you, said he'd remind you of things he's told you. Hallelujah. Said that he'd show you things to come. God, the Spirit of God will show you what to do. You have an unction from the Holy One. And in that unction, that's where you know. The Holy Spirit doesn't always speak, but when he hears, he'll speak. He's the relayer. He's the friend of the bridegroom. Hallelujah. He'll tell you things to come. Father, I pray over every person right now, and I thank you for their, their time. I'm so honored that they would tune into this. I release my faith now in the name of Jesus. They are the redeemed. They're healed in Jesus' name. You've delivered them, and you are leading them through this time, Lord. You're leading them. You're guiding them. You're showing them things to come. You are with them. Yes. Never to forsake them. Never. You're with them, Lord. Lord. And I declare and I believe that they are developing. They are becoming. We are all becoming. We're being landscaped, yes. groomed, yes. matured in this season. Yes, We're enduring. And we're growing more character. And that character will give us an experience. And that experience causes us to not have any shame. Because the love of God has been poured out into our spirit by the Holy Spirit. We give you the praise and we give you the glory. We thank you that we can come boldly into the presence of God. Because God rent his own garments. We give you praise tonight. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so honored that you would. We'll see you Sunday morning at 1030. God bless you. Love you so much.